Now, Monday is going to be our new well-being day, and today we are talking about brain fog. Just to start off with explaining about, a bit about brain mm. fog, um, it's not a diagnosis, it's not a disease, it's not a disorder. Rather, it's actually a symptom or a sign of uh, a number of things. It could be a sign of an underlying medical condition. Um, it could be the result of hormonal changes. It could be the consequence of dietary or lifestyle issues. Um, so there's a number of factors that can contribute to it. It affects um, millions of people actually globally. But what about so people have kids? You know, we often hear a baby brain. Yes. And is that just literally a lack of sleep and you just have so much on? No, that's the hormonal changes I'm talking about. So with the hormonal changes, um, you can experience uh, some of the symptoms of brain fog. And that can actually occur with premenstrual symptom, pregnancy, menopause, low testosterone. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I looked at you when I, when I said that. <laughs> <laughs> what I was trying to be was inclusive, that it's just not female, <laughs> female hormone changes. Too inclusive. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Sabina Brennan, you are very welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having and me. And I told you, I have been a bit of a fan of yours from afar because I've heard you speak. It's the way you speak about a topic that you wouldn't necessarily think would be as interesting as you make it. You make it sound like a very fascinating subject. But it is fascinating. I, you know, I mean, the brain is, oh, you know, it's... it's <laughs> <laughs> I told it's you, like, I want to George say, Clooney. I want to say <laughs> sexy subject, and I was afraid to, but you do make it sound like a sexy oh, subject. Oh, thanks very much. But, yeah, I think we, we see too much of these. You know, when you see the brain, you're usually seeing a dead brain, you know, that's been preserved in formaldehyde. And it's Ooh. not the prettiest thing. It's definitely no George Clooney. No. But the real brain is, like, vibrant. You've got 86 billion neurons in your brain, brain cells, and trillions of connections. And they're constantly firing chemical and electrical signals to each other. Like, your brains are on fire here at wow. the moment. Um, and that's really exciting. And that's the kind of thing that, that really... It's kind of the final frontier of our body, isn't it? But it's all going on in your brain. Wow. Yeah. Now, your brain is very interesting in itself. You only went back to study. You starred in Fair City. You had an acting career and then decided, no, I'm going back and I'm going to study yeah. a PhD on the um, brain. You can only go back to university if you went to university in the first place. So I never went to university in the first place. I actually did my leaving when I was about 16 and went straight into working um, in an insurance company, actually. And then uh, when I had my own kids, I said, no, I want to do something I'm passionate about. So I acted for a while. And the reason I acted is because I'm interested in human behaviour, why people do the things they do. So then, long story short, I did a degree in psychology and then I got a scholarship to do a PhD in the Institute of Neuroscience in Trinity wow. and did that around uh, the brain and how it changes with age and memory function. And actually, it was during that, having come from a regular background, like a non-academic background, um, I was passionate. I drove all the other students insane because I had ate all the, I, like I'd read, I'd yeah. read all the books before the, yeah. the term even started, you know. But what really jumped out at me in the Institute of Neuroscience, and there is amazing scientists there, um, and they're doing incredible work. Um, but a lot of the time they're talking to other scientists about their work at niche conferences or in academic journals that you and I don't have access mm -hmm. to. And actually, because they're behind paywalls, but even if you did have access to them, you wouldn't bloody understand no. it because mm -hmm. it's a different language. Mm -hmm. Now, I enjoyed that as an undergrad, learning that language. And it was great to feel as someone who'd left school 20-odd mm -hmm. years before, because I was terrified going to university. Because, uh, And I would say that to anyone out there who is thinking about going to university older, Go for it. There is no... Don't underestimate your life experience, all mm, those things yeah. that you've got. You've dealt with mortgages, you've raised kids, you've held down jobs. All of those things give you an advantage over the younger kids who are coming straight in. Um, so anyway, that's sidetracking <laughs> yeah. there. Um, but really what jumped out at me was that I read, started to read all this information about things that you can do to boost your brain health, things that you can do to reduce your risk of developing dementia, things that can help you have a better prognosis should you sustain a brain injury or a disease like multiple sclerosis in early life. And I just said, everybody deserves to know People that information. Know that. Absolutely. The fact of the matter is only 5% of people aged over 65 are frail and in need of nursing homes. What about the other 95% who are doing wonderful things, exciting things, enjoying life, embracing life? There's loads of older adult role models and, and you know, people taking up things at 80. 
but I just think we need to change our attitude, our own attitude towards aging and, and see it as a, you know, a time for opportunity and to build on our life experience and wisdom. First test that we're going to do is a little short memory test. The word one is really tapping into your working memory. Okay, so Ava, I'm going to show you a list of words. I want you to look at those words. I'm going to time you for 30 seconds and then I'm going to ask you to turn the sheet over and write down as many as you can remember. Okay? Okay. You can start now. Okay, so let's look and see how you did. So you got, you got nine. So the average number of chunks of information that can be stored in short-term memory is seven plus or minus two. So if you score between five and nine, your short-term memory is wor working at average capacity. Average? I don't want to be average. <laughs> for this test, I'm going to set a timer for one minute, and I want you to name as many animals as you can in that time. Go. Dog, cat, donkey. <sighs> Hens, chick. So the way the scores work for this, um, is they're done by age range, 16 to 59, and then also your years of education. So I'm going to calculate your score now, but given that English isn't your first language, that's really going to impact on this score. So an average score there would be 22. I'm a little nervous telling you this score. So you scored 20. You're very welcome to the show, Good Sabina. Good to have you again. Thank you very much. Yes, our brains, I suppose it is an organ, and often we ignore it. Absolutely, absolutely. We carry it around in our head and don't give it a second thought. Um, and brain health really matters because you need your brain for everything. You mm -hmm. certainly do, across the board, every day. But why, why, why don't we have emphasis on, on the brain like we do other parts of our body? I don't know. I think it's because it's so integrated with us and because we can't see it. We talk about physical health and mm -hmm. thankfully in re recent years we're talking more and more about mental health. But uh, it kind of seemed crazy to me that nobody was talking about brain health. Um, and as I said, you need your brain for absolutely everything. And it really is important. It's your most important organ. Mm -hmm. I know you've done an awful lot. You're a research uh, a psychologist and you've done an awful lot of work in this area on dementia on a European level as well. What do you see where we rank in Ireland when it comes to dementia and, and brain ageing? Currently, there's about 50 million people globally living with dementia in Ireland. Yeah, in Ireland, we have about 55,000 mm -hmm. people. And those figures are set to to treble. Mm -hmm. Currently there's no cure, so um, prevention is key. The World Health Organization and various, you know, national um, dementia strategies and groups, you know, all prioritise uh, prevention as and key. And you, be you believe that you can actually prevent dementia? So based on things, for example, uh, we know uh, that about 30% of all cases of Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia, mm. are attributable to just seven modifiable risk factors. And what are they? So they are um, low levels of physical activity, mm -hmm. low levels of educational attainment or mental stimulation, mm -hmm. midlife obesity, type 2 diabetes, midlife hypertension, depression, and smoking. And doing all this now, say I'm 42 years of age, yeah. I, sh I should be doing all these things now. Sabine. Everybody with Everyone. a brain should be doing it. Yeah. I mean, I'm passionate. I'm trying you to work on... You shouldn't wait 60 or 60. No, 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 absolutely not. I mean, I am passionate about, um, you know, raising awareness about brain health for kids. Mm -hmm. You know, people tend to talk about ageing when we hit, like, you know, 50 or, or whatever, but we're ageing right across mm -hmm. our lifespan. What, what, can you give us an example, a physical example of what we can do? Um, well, physical exercise is superb for your brain. Your brain only weighs, weighs about 2% of your body, but it consumes 25% of your nutrients, right? So it's a, it's a high energy organ. And that's why heart health features so much in the risk factors for dementia, because your cardiovascular system, your heart, pumps all the energy, oxygen and nutrients mm. that your brain needs. So they say feed your brain, they actually mean it. You actually do need to feed your brain, yes. It, and and um, the thing is, if your vascular system is clogged or not working properly, um, areas of your brain will be deprived of the oxygen and nutrients they need and will actually die off. Tell us a little bit more about sleep and how it works with our brain. Okay, so as I said, when, when you go to sleep, so during the day as you're taking information in, you're taking in lots and lots of information, but it's sort of in, a, it's kept in a, like a temporary repository called your hippocampus, which is really deep in your brain. Um, but that needs to be cleared of that information so that it can take more information in tomorrow. So when you go asleep in the early part of the night, when you have lots of non-OREM sleep, 
um, we see activation in the brain between that hippocampus and your frontal lobes. And um, this, we think, is like a filtering system that's going, forget that, forget that, oh, keep this, this mm -hmm. is important, right? And so your memories are started then, whatever's kept as a memory is integrated across your brain and, and embedded into your brain as a things memory. Things you need to keep, important the things, information. The things you want to keep, and so that you can recall it the next day. Mm -hmm. So it's called consolidation. But then, in the later part of the night, which is really the part of the morning before mm -hmm. we wake up, where you have more... REM sleep, which is where you dream. Activity, yeah. Those new memories, and this is really why you dream, those new memories are then integrated with relevant past experiences that you have had. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why often you wake up in the morning with the solution to a problem, with an idea for something new or an insight. And that's why sleep is so important for Yeah, the, the old adage, you know, sleep on it, is supported by the science. I want to know if there's something wrong with me because I don't feel any desire to have a baby yet. So I don't feel very maternal. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't be mad into kids and I don't think I'm going to have any kids myself. What is a maternal instinct? That's funny how you, you phrase that because you're saying you don't have any maternal instinct but I wouldn't expect you to have any maternal instinct because you're not a mother yet. Mm. So. I think it's important to draw a distinction between a drive to have a baby, uh, which I think is what you're talking about, that you don't feel like you have a drive to have kids, and maternal instinct, which is something very different. Maternal instinct is about uh, nurturing and protecting your baby. Yeah. And the thing is, that really kicks in after you've had your baby. I'm not supposed to have one. So there's nothing wrong with me. I'm not missing anything. I'm not missing a maternal chip or anything. I'm going to ask you a question now. I know we've only just met, right? Yeah. <laughs> but I'm going to ask you a personal question. So do you like to have sex? Yes. Okay, it's the drive to have sex that is important in terms of, you know, the species continuing on. But I don't know anybody who has sex to ensure the survival of the species. What are the main reasons do you think that people decide to have babies if it's not a, if it's not an instinctual thing you hear about the ticking biological clock and if you talk to people um, who do you know feel their biological clock ticking and decide to have babies in later life it's generally not because they have put off a desire for ages it's they go whoa the window's closing yeah. it's now or never Totally, yes. Now, it turns out that we all, you know, sleep. I think we probably do realise it is a big factor, but it is a huge factor keeping your brain healthy. So here to tell us more about brain health um, is expert Dr. Sabina Brennan. How are you, Sabina? Good to see you. How are Hi, things? good. Thank you for having yes, me. Yes, sleep. You know what? In the lives most of us live today, we probably don't get enough sleep. How much sleep do we need to actually take care of our brain health? Our brain works for us 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So when we sleep, our brain actually has a job of work to do. And part of what it does actually, you you could consider it like baking in our memories and sorting through um, the activities that uh -huh. we've engaged in during the day. So you need your sleep to be able to remember. Yeah, Can I ask you a question important. though about, you said quality yeah. sleep, what does that mean? Does that mean that you need to go into like a deep REM sleep yes. to actually? Yes, okay. absolutely. So, um, and, and that's what you said, we all live, live very active, almost stressful lives. A lot yeah. of us are living in a state of chronic stress mm -hmm. and that's something that can impact on your ability to get into that lovely deep sleep because stress plays around with your cortisol levels. Yeah. And um, you need cortisol, it, it, it's, it's good. It's the thing that gets you out of bed in the morning. But if you're stressed, it can be sloshing around your brain at the wrong times of the day and can wake you up in the middle of the night and your, yeah. your so mind starts racing. There okay. they are probably people like myself sometimes that find it hard to switch off. Yes. Mm. And you lie in bed, you're really, really tired, but your brain just keeps going and going and going. Do we have tricks to stop this? Or? Yeah, there's a few things. I mean, I don't know about you. We mentioned you were talking about technology mm -hmm. earlier on. Um, and a lot of us, you know, after a long day like this, I don't know, do you do it sometimes? I go home and I say, I'm going to chill out and I'm going to watch some Netflix. Mm -hmm. And you yeah. might pick, you know, watch a couple of episodes. Yeah. And actually, that's probably not a good thing to do if you want to relax and, and actually get into 
a proper position so that you can sleep because the blue light mm -hmm. yeah. actually wakes up your brain. Yeah, the te any technology yeah. looking at computers all that type yeah. of thing is not good. Okay. Absolutely. So you're spot on there. So really one of the top tips is make your bedroom a technology free yeah. zone. Because we do it for our children because when we're getting babies ready to go to bed we make sure that the environment is correct and everything. Yeah. We should be doing the same thing for ourselves. No, absolutely. So get, get the technology out of the bedroom is, is, is a good tip. Um, you know, get an old fashioned clock so don't depend on your phone for an alarm clock mm. but you need some downtime before you go to sleep so maybe we used to have people used to have baths at night time mm.